just want to remind you that every plate is America's best value meal kit. While most meal kits come with a premium price tag, every plate offers delicious dinners that I promise won't break the bank. Try every plate for just $1.79 per meal. That's up to $104 value. Go to everyplate.com and enter code FUNCHES179. It's about Yes. Hi, how are you doing? It's me, it's Ron. Welcome to uh, uh, the In Progress new studio. We are at the very beginning. There's still a bunch of boxes behind me and a lot of things just not set up. This is probably not going to be in the main chair that we use. This is going to be the background uh, that we use most likely. There's a lot of things changing. We've got a new house, new things going on. Thank you for listening. And I need you to just spread the word if you can help people find the podcast give us five star reviews on apple if you go on the youtube please subscribe to my youtube uh, we're posting up more videos and clips there as well as just my pro wrestling matches and things of that nature so go check it out um you know you can support the, uh do patreon patreon.com slash getting better with ron if you want to get your uh, personal thank you notes if you want to get free t-shirts uh other things that we would love to send to you and exclusive podcast episodes that you can only find on the patreon so go check it out as well i would appreciate that twitch.tv ron underscore funges is where you can hang out with the funch bunch join the funch bunch discord and play some video games or just watch along with me we love it building a fun community so if you want to come play games if you're a big gaming person come hang out with us at the twitch um also i just announced my new tour so please come see me do shows i'm gonna be june 9th through 11th at the dc improv don't forget may single day mayo i'm in los angeles at the troubadour for the netflix is a joke festival and then i'm uh doing uh, that's the one we need to worry about so please come to that one june 9th through 11th dc improv june 23rd philadelphia punchline june 24th new york gramercy theater june 25th boston wilbur theater july 9th seattle neptune theater july 10th san francisco at Cobbs. i love it there july 26th through the 30th at phoenix stand up live august 4th at minneapolis varsity theater august 5th i'm coming back home to chicago baby i'm at the den august 11th through 13th i'm in kansas city at the kansas city comedy club and august 26 27 san diego at the american comedy club one of my favorite places to perform uh we'll be bringing blair we'll be bringing in carmen we'll be bringing gabe we'll be bringing special guests you never know who you're gonna see so please get tickets they'll be uh, on sale this wednesday you can go to ronfunches.com you can just go give it a google on ron funches i'm gonna be in a city near you please come check it out as well i can finally announce my new tv show that's coming out loot comes out june 24th on apple tv plus uh is that what it's still called if it's just apple tv now i think they still got the plus i'm not sure either way the place where they got the ted lassos go there on june 24th and watch loot me maya rudolph nat faxon joe kim booster stephanie styles megan faye michaela j rodriguez i almost forgot one of my favorites it's gonna be a great show i'm really excited about the acting and the fun work that i did and that we all did it's a great fucking cast so please check that out if you can we're gonna try to get a bunch of the cast to come on um and do some interviews do a series of, of cast interviews that'll be fun time so please come that other than that let's get into it i hope you're feeling strong Malcolm, I'm recording a podcast. Okay. I need you to keep it quiet. Just get out of the bathroom for a while. Feels like you're still in the bathroom. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> we can just keep all that. <laughs> we still figuring things out in a new podcast studio but i'm loving it i hope you're feeling strong i hope you're feeling brave 
I hope you're feeling loved. I hope you're grateful for that love. I hope you're accepting of change and new things coming to your way uh, just as they are for me. This is really me just talking about me right now. Uh, sometimes. How, well, how are you back in the bathroom? And some things never change. <laughs> Hey, dealing with your son. It's fun. I wouldn't want it to change. I love this kid so much. He's going to be 19 on Saturday. It's amazing. That's beautiful. And so much growth, so much change with him, with me as a father. Uh, and, and now getting ready to have a new baby anytime now. Uh, so I'm just excited and full and moving into a new house. So this is a lot of change. And sometimes you, you, you want, you ask for things, you want things in your life. I want a, a bigger family. I wanted to move into a bigger house and then you get them all at once. And then you feel like maybe this is too much, but you gotta be able to handle just as you can, you can handle turmoil and strife and struggle and, and, and lack of things learning how to handle abundance is a skill as well being able to be accepting of gifts being accepting of joy and in so many ways is it's like a birth in its own knowing that we got it things are messy things are uh not always perfect but we're are uh, happy and joyful and excited about the new surroundings and the new things going on in our life. And there's the opportunity, mostly the opportunity to continue to create. So I, I, as I've been thinking about things more and more, I guess because I get older and getting ready to have another kid and stuff about just what's truly important to me and what I want in life. And, and what I truly want is just, continued opportunity to create to um to sell to pitch to enjoy life to work out to have fun to make mistakes i just want to be able i feel like um there's a lot of time i've been seeing a, a lot online listening to other podcasts where people are acting like it's the end of the world all the time you know they're like oh why should we even we're living in, you hear that shit all the time but we're living in the end days we're living in the ends of times we, nobody else had to ever had to deal with all this stuff we, nobody had to deal with pandemics and this and that and it's like what do you mean who are people with the spanish flu there was a pandemic oh you never had to deal with the threat of russia and nuclear war well that actually goes back a fucking quite a long time if you think about it there's people in, from the 19 fucking 40s and 50s who that's what they went to school learning about was to be afraid the threat of being nuclearly wiped out was always there and so to me it's no different things are fucking weird things are fucking rough things are beautiful and things are um easy it's all of these things all these things are true and so you guys just be accepting of all these things and move forward in this world because as as we learn uh you know no matter how long you live by the end of it life seems short i lost my grandma uh this last week um my mom lost her best friend a week or so before and it's just just goes to show you that you gotta it's better. We don't know what's on the other side. And what do you believe in? If you believe in heaven, if you believe in reincarnation, you believe in whatever. But I know at least for right now, for me, it's just better to be here. It's better to be here where I have the opportunity to be, to yell at my son for being in the bathroom. I got the opportunity to be around my wife. I got the opportunity to work with people that I love and enjoy. It's just nothing is promised. Nothing is, is 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 just given to you in this world, but at the same time, having the ability to wake up and, and manifest, to think yourself out of situations, and to create real magic. To, I mean, I think about that all the time. The fact that I'm in my my new house based off of my belief that I could write jokes. And my belief that I could, once I started writing jokes, my belief that I could act, my belief that I could vo do voices, all these things 
seemed impossible when I was working at a grocery store in Salem, Oregon, and I was 19 and a half going on 20, and I have a six-month pregnant wife. At that time, things seemed very far away. They seemed very impossible. But it just goes to show you that just putting in the effort, putting in time, just enjoying the journey. You never know where you end up. It's not always where you want it to be. It's not always where you think you're going to be, but that's fucking seems so fun so far. So I've just been thinking about like, if you're surrounded by people who are negative to you right now, because it seems like it's a real epidemic of just negativity and just, people being depressed and and upset and then spreading that to other people. Uh, Just remind yourself that you have the opportunity to do what you want and have changes and nothing comes quick. Nothing comes quick. Nothing comes easy, but things can come. If you, if you're really meant to do things, if you really believe in yourself, you put forth that effort and it can come at any age, any time I seem, you know, People get real successful and not until they're fucking 50s. And, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you get it in your 20s or you get it in your 50s as long as you get it. And especially, again, if you're taking care of your health and taking care of your the, your ability to get more opportunities, then if you get it in your 50s, you got hopefully another 30, 35 years where you can enjoy it. So just have fun. That's really all I'm trying to say. And remember that life is good. Not always great or perfect, but it is good. And I hope you continue living and going for great opportunities. And I hope you enjoy this classic Getting Better episode with one of my favorite guests, someone who I never thought would be sitting right here in my house with me, in my old house. Now I'm in my new house. But when I was in my old house, he came and he sat there and he was like, oh my God, I used to watch you on the television all the time and you're my favorite. Made me so happy. I fanboyed out for a long time. You can listen to it right now if you didn't hear it before. It's our episode with WWE Hall of Famer. One time, one of the most famous people in the entire world. And a guy who just had a recent match at WrestleMania came back out and kicked Vince McMahon's ass. It's Stone Cold Steve Austin. Hope you Enjoy it. Now, um, is your lighting okay with me wearing my hat? Or yeah, okay, fine. yeah, it's casual. Thanks for coming. Glad to be here. Are we rolling? Yeah, we're definitely rolling. We're always rolling, right, Halston? We oh, got, so you got all that stuff I was talking about ago that could incriminate me. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't badmouth nobody, did I? No, 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 uh, no. Unfortunately, uh, probably help us get get viewers and listeners. Uh, but uh, one thing, uh, first of all, thank you for coming so much. I really appreciate you taking the time out of the day. I know you're a busy, dude. You got, I am, you got but I always make time for you. I appreciate you make time it. for me. Yes, I rolled over here in my 2003 Ford Focus, and I got here early. Man, traffic wasn't nothing. <laughs> so I breezed up. I was like, dude, it's 1230. I can't go hang out with Ron. I can't just go hang out at Ron's house all day. And so I was I was creeping down there on the damn curb, just sitting there idling. I said, man, I got a low front tire. I'm about to run out of gas. But I'm at Ron's house. I ain't leaving now. But I'm here. <laughs> I just hope I got enough air to get back down to 405. <laughs> and you made it, and I really appreciate it. And Because and, 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 you're a national icon, as everybody knows. You're a treasure. Uh, everybody enjoys you. Um, one of the things that I want to say that I enjoy about you, not just from your work and and, and, and the character, uh, but you as a person, is like the fact that you did. You just rolled down here in, 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 your, in your very, very normal car. And um dealing with you is extremely normal i just text you as you come over send you the details and you come on through it's a very you're very um a low-key guy at, at all times you're what i would say is like a regular a regular man's man um with so many people i know especially in my business entertainment business you don't go to them directly you don't talk to them directly you don't schedule with them what, what why why all these years later do you still stay like that? Low key, no posse, no overhead. Uh, you know, I, I'm I'm the guy to go to. So yeah, I, I just rather do things on my own. I mean, 
Now, if, if we're not, if we're trying to promote something, you know, like, uh, like, uh, my show on USA network or whatever, I mean, then, then, then I have some channels. I got a publicist and an agent and all that stuff from UTA, but anything on my own, uh, just kind of personal related. I, I just rather be the, be the guy to go to. And the less people have around, around you, I mean, there's fewer headaches. I, I've, I've had people come over and I don't mind it, but I've had people come over and do my podcast. I mean, I don't, I don't like bringing a whole entourage with them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's cool. But I've always been that way. I've always been a loner. So it's nothing new. It's just the way I've always operated. Mm -hmm. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. I'm, I'm a lot of the same way. I did. And I never even really knew another way. I didn't know it was different, but I would show up on these talk shows or things like that. I went on a, a, a young lady you might may or may not know named Lily Singh. She has a, a talk show and I went there and I was just there by myself and she was like, where's all your people? And I was like, I don't get it. Yeah. I was just like, this is a job. Why would I bring a bunch of people to work? Like, I don't, I've never understood that, but I think that's a difference from people who look at it from all, um, just what they can get from entertainment and all the, the, the pluses and the fun and the, and, and other people who just were like, this is the way I feed my family and this is my job and this is my work. And I, I just appreciate that about you. Oh man, it just rolled up and uh, ready to shoot the breeze with you. You you did the same thing when you came to my place. Yeah, well, that's how I am. That's yeah. what I think. What I like yeah. about you, what we like about each other. Um, and one thing I know, it's so weird to me because um, the bigger people that I've dealt with, people who I would say are legends in their industry, um, and, and in your industry in particular, people like you or, or Rick Flair, who I've had to deal with, you're, you're all kind of like that. You're all kind of your own people. You don't. You do what you want, and you. Um, there's not much ego in dealing with, but I've, I've also dealt with people who are kind of like in the middle ground of wrestling and they have the biggest heads of all. I don't understand that. Man, it's guys that come from like, like, uh, like Rick or like myself, man, we're old school. So everything is kind of done by yourself. And then you get some people, not, not everybody, and this is, this is an indictment on everybody, but sometimes, you know, some, some people get a little bit of exposure and I'll say, Oh. I got to have this. I got to have that. I got to have one of these. I got to have that. And they kind of start growing things. They kind of spend things out of proportion. And they're, I think maybe they are, they think they're more than there are, or, or maybe they need that support system. I don't know. I just do it. it. It's funny. Sometimes when you come to LA and I've been here for a long time, but when you work on some productions and some, some different sets, it's like, man, these people actually treat you like a human being. Uh, not that they don't in the business of professional wrestling, but mm -hmm. way back in the wild, wild West days, you know, it was every man for itself. So you, you roll on set and do a movie and you have everybody saying, Hey, Mr. Austin, Hey kid, you need this. You need that. It's like, Hey, we didn't, we didn't even know this existed. So when you get that, you're just extremely grateful for it. We're just used to kind of just being, you know, what we are. Mm -hmm. I think that's, uh, um, something that's just very similar between the lives of, of comedians and pro wrestlers, but especially when it comes to, to stand up. And I want to get your opinion on it because it's something I've thought about a lot, but there just seems to be, such a crossover between those lives, the similarity as far as like being a lone wolf, honing your teeth for upwards of a decade or more. And then sometimes get, then you get your shot and then same thing. You go on these things and they're treating you nice. It's like, oh, I'm used to being pushed into a storage closet and told to, you know, do 60 minutes and then just get, you know, $500 going my way, you yeah. know? It's like, oh, you guys are treating me nice. And, and then I see all these other actors who are complaining all the time. And I'm just like, what the fuck? What are you, what's wrong with you? Y'all got it good. Yeah. And th is that something that you think maybe has changed because you, you are one of the last of the territory guys, as far as like the traditional sense of that word. And, and you, so it would be similar that you ha were doing the lone wolf thing. And then now it seems like it's a lot easier for someone 22, 20, 23 years old to get a contract and they're immediately given you know craft services and the best of things do you think um that has kind of limited maybe their creativity or what do you think there's a difference in 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 the eras in that way uh you know the eras have changed just as far as things being you know more, better medical you know they're, you know they're catering for these guys you know back in the old days you wouldn't have that stuff but i, I again for me specifically and and Probably you could identify with this as well. I mean, that's the way I've always done it. So it's, it's who I am as a person. If, if I wasn't here or if I never got into wrestling, hell, I used to drive a forklift on a freight dock before I got into business. And, you know, I had my buddies up there, but, you know, put me on my forklift, give me my truck to unload, and I'm just going to do my 
do my thing and work and I'll talk to people, but uh, I'm good just being by myself. Yeah, lone wolf and then I think that just uh, um man, I agree with that. I love that as a trait. Um I wanna ask you about I wanna go back and ask you about when you started in, in pro wrestling or a little bit before you started. Um was that when you were forklift driving but like then what what drove you to to make that leap into the business? What made you change? Well, I always wanted to be a pro wrestler because, you know, I, I grew up watching it in South Texas when I was a kid, seven or eight years old. And then I got a few football scholarships and I ended up at North Texas State University uh, right outside of Dallas, Texas. And Dallas, Texas was home to the world famous Von Erichs and the, the famous building, the Sportatorium. And see, being, being such a fan, it was only 30 miles from Denton to Dallas. So I'd drive down with some of my college buddies and, uh, man, we'd get drunk and throw stuff at the wrestlers and we'd go to Saturday morning TV tapings the very next day, or I'd go by myself to that one. And, you know, I was working on a freight dock. My scholarship had ran out. I dropped out of college with 17 hours to graduate. I said, man, I said, these damn research papers just killing me. I don't <laughs> want to do no more of them. So I just quit. And it hurt my parents because I would have been the only kid to graduate from college, you know? And so anyway, I stopped. I was working on that uh, forklift, and I, I went back to my uh, my apartment, and I saw a commercial for Chris Adams Wrestling School on TV. And uh, I said, hell, man, you pay $45, you go see the seminar. And it was on Saturday morning right after TV taping. So that that's where I said, hey, man, this is my ticket in. So I went to the seminar, paid my 45 bucks, talked to Chris Adams. And then, you know, I joined up, and the rest is history. You know, I, I starved for a long ass time. And, you know, two months after I started, you know, the, the territory was basically based in Tennessee. So I was still working full time, working 40 uh, hours a week on the, on the forklift on the freight dock. And I asked Jerry Jarrett who had bought the promotion. I said, Hey, when can I start working full time? He said, I think you're ready now, Steve. And so two weeks later, there I was driving my, my base model Hyundai Excel to Memphis to have my first match at the Mid-South Coliseum. And then I would go on to live in this shit box on the wrong side of town uh, in Nashville, Tennessee, and starve. But that, that's what that's what got me into business. Saw the commercial on TV. I always wanted to do it. I said, here's my foot in the door. I, I mean, that seems so similar to um, most people that just get this spark of inspiration and then – like, but is there any part of you where you want, did you ever think like maybe this wouldn't work out for me or was it kind of like you got started and it was like, you like this works. This is what I, this, I like the feeling of this. No, there wasn't no plan B. I mean, I knew I wanted to do it. I didn't know what, what it would lead to. I didn't have any aspirations of being the, the number one wrestler, you know, in the world at any time, which I would become, but I just wanted to be a damn wrestler. I just enjoyed what I watched you know, going on in the ring. I thought it'd be cool to do. And back in the day, you know, when you was a kid and even when I uh, was going through the wrestling school, I thought something was up, <laughs> but they didn't smarten me up. And you know, I'm fixing to go to my first match in the sportatorium. And that's finally when Chris Adams smartened me up about you know, how, how you can call things in the ring. And it's not really a shoot as we would say, or real. So, uh, yeah, I just, I, I got in. And there was no looking back. There wasn't plan B. I wasn't going to quit. I wasn't going to go back to the uh, driving a forklift. I wasn't going to go uh, re-enroll in college, get to 17 hours and be a, a teacher and a PE coach or, you know, coach football or whatever. Once I made up my mind, that was the only option. Fail failure was never an option. Mm. It wasn't a choice. I could have failed, but shit, I was, I was just so focused uh, and, and I lived it, breathed it, and slept it, and ate it 24-7. I was a student of the game, and that helped me. Did you love it? Loved it. Yeah. I think, I mean, yeah, that's where it's so similar, but in, in way different jobs, way different jobs. I went to pro wrestling school. I went to Santino's Bros for like three months. I was like, no, this isn't. I was not like, this is what my calling is. I was like, no, this hurts, and I'm not naturally good at it. But it was the same thing for me with stand up when I um, I always knew when I was five years old, I was like, this is what something I want to do. And it took a lot of years for me to get the courage to try it. But my very first mic, I was like, this is this is my calling. This is my thing. They're like the same thing. I was like, there is no plan B. 
however, I will lower my standards of living to just make sure I can do this for the rest of my life. I won't, you know, whatever this provides, whatever comedy provides me is what I'm going to live off of because I love comedy. I study comedy, whether, you know, whether it's like stand up or just Lucille Ball or Carol Burnett or, or, or uh, anything. I just anything I can get my hand on. Or I would watch and. I think that's something when you really love something and when you really want to try to achieve something outside of the ordinary, you have to have that type of stubbornness and focus um, in order to be successful at it. Is that something that you had over time or is that something you felt like you were born with? Was that just like you were just always just a stubborn dude and like once I make my mind up, I'm doing it? I'm hard headed, just like my mother. And if I make up my mind, I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. And you know, like going, <laughs> going back to, to what do you say, standard of living, or you know, mm-hmm. I, I I never lived a high life. You know, we were brought up in South Texas. My dad would balance his checkbook every month, and if that damn thing was a nickel off, he'd yell out my mom's name, Beverly. My mom would come in there with her checkbook, and they'd get to, they'd get that damn thing dialed in. It's back when people wrote checks. I don't mm-hmm. know, how, you know, everybody just uses a credit card or PayPal or whatever anymore. But uh, my 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 point is, we learned the value of a dollar. And you know, coming up in uh in Tennessee, you know, when you get in there, then veterans say, "Hey, kids, save your money." Hey, shit, man, it's hard to save money when you ain't making no money, <laughs> much less eat. So yeah, man, uh, my my expectations were low. Pay was low. And I, I, I never, I never did spend a lot of money. So I always knew the value of a dollar and I knew, I knew that it was something that I wanted to do. And there, there was no, no ifs, ands or buts. Hmm. Let's skip ahead a little bit. Um, I want to talk a bit about when you were probably like right before you were getting ready to leave WCW or that time period where you were like, that's probably when I was most aware of you or when I started being aware of you is when you were in a dangerous alliance and then also uh, teaming with, with Brian Pillman, um, which is one of my favorite tag teams of all time. I to- think I told you that on your podcast. And there's time when you know you're killing it and you know you're one of the best and they're not giving you a push. They're not giving you the credit you deserve is how I'll, I'll put it for just regular people. They're not giving you the credit that your effort is showing and there's a frustration coming out and you're getting ready to be fired. Um, I don't, it's not a real question, but was there any time in that life where you wanted to get fired? Because that's when like things kind of really shifted for you where you found your Stone Cold persona when you went to ECW. Um, how does that happen? Is it just through anger and frustration and not thinking? Is there any part of you at that point that, that you were like, maybe, fuck it, it's just not working out. I love it, but they're not give, giving me the credit that I get for how hard I fucking work? Or was there anything like that? Man, I, you just, you, you get a, you know, when you think you're better than what they think you are and you think you deserve better storylines or, or, or more of a push, that's frustrating. But then, you know, finally, you just, kind of like man fuck it 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 is what it is they got the top guys you know i'm kind of somewhere in the middle and then you know they split me and brian up which is political we started to get over you know if they'd left us together for a couple years we would have been best one of the best tag teams of all time we we were good for when we were together and i love brian but it used to reach a period of frustration and i never wanted to be fired because you know that means you ain't got no more income coming in and I knew, you know, WWF at the time was kind of interested in me, but only as a mechanic. They didn't see any kind of star potential in me whatsoever. So, you know, it's just kind of like, you know, they start feeding you shit sandwiches. And, you know, when they start feeding you shit sandwiches, if you ain't got no other options, you eat them. Hmm. And you ain't happy eating them, but, you know, th- th- that's what it is. So anyway, I tore my tricep off my arm uh, in a tour of Japan on the third night of a three-week tour. And when you, back in those days, when you tear your tricep off your arm, you don't fly home. You work for two and a half weeks with a torn tricep. So, you know, I had that thing reattached. And during the healing process is when I got fired. And that sucked. And then, uh, you know, that's when Paul E called me. And he says, hey, man, come up to work for me. And it was for nominal money, one day a week. And I told him, I, sh- I told him, I said, shit, you know, Paul, my arm's busted. I can't work. And he says, you ain't got to work. Just cut promos. So I went up there, but, you know, to, to answer your question, that I think he was asking, you know, I never wanted to be fired. I was fired. I'm glad I did because had I not, none of the stuff would have 
that followed would have ever happened. I wouldn't have had the creative opportunity to launch into the mindset, you know, when, uh, at, at King of the Ring in 96, when Mark Merrill kicked me in the mouth, I had to go get the stitches. Jake got the religious promo on me. Doc Henrich told me about the religious promo. Uh, Triple H was supposed to win King of the Ring in 1996. Uh, they were punishing him for the curtain call in the garden. I mean, it was like this perfect storm of events and all the stars aligned for me to win that dang uh, tournament style pay-per-view with everything that happened and to come up with two grand slams in one promo, Austin 316 and because Stone Cold said so. So, you know, everything just kind of turned into a fluke after that. And then I just was able to capitalize on it. Yeah. But it's like, there is no real fluke though, because you, um, you were already great. That's the, but thing. I needed to break. I yeah. remember when I was down in WCW, uh, I was working with Ricky Steamboat. He'd already had his really good run with uh, WWF. And, of course, Steamboat's one of the greatest of all time and the greatest babyface of all time along with Ricky Morton. Uh, and, and since I was working with him, and he was also working with Ravishing Rick Rude, who'd you know, come off a, a hell of a run up there. And I was trying to put the pieces together, man. I was a good mechanic. I was fine in the ring, but I was trying to emulate the style of Ric Flair, mm -hmm. who I consider the GOAT, and many do, uh, world champion. I mean, the traveling world champion, you know, Rick is the goat. And I was trying to, you know, modify, you know, I was basically trying to, you know, emulate his style, you know, scientific, you know, chain style wrestling. I was, I was good at it, but I wasn't Ric Flair and it wasn't what was resonating with the people, you know, the stone cold thing. Uh, but, but I asked Ricky, I said, cause he would know, I said, Ricky, I said, what am I missing? And he goes, shit, Steve, I don't think you're missing anything. I was missing the gimmick, you know, I was missing the character, which, you know, I would come up with later, you know, mm -hmm. you know, once I, you know, gotten labeled as a ringmaster and had my foot in the door. And, and that's when I saw that, that special on HBO about Richard Kuklinski, the, the ice man. And that's when that thing all clicked in together. But, you know, I was just trying, I was still trying to find my way. Thank you, every play, for sponsoring the podcast. I appreciate that because I love eating food and I especially love it when it's simple and easy and affordable. Every plate is, of course, America's best value meal kit. While most meal kits come with a premium price tag, every plate does not. They offer delicious dinner that will not break the bank. I promise you. So why go outside? Why go out there and go rummaging? foraging for your food like you're some type of savage well you could let every plate shop and deliver everything you need to cook a delicious meal at a consistently low price choose from 17 delicious weekly recipes and then I guess just sit back they'll deliver pre-portioned ingredients and easy to follow recipe cards right to your door that seems very simple you could think of it this way one meal from every plate is about the same price as a one cup of coffee i mean come on which one would you rather have one cup of coffee or one full meal i don't drink coffee so the answer is easy for me maybe it's harder for others i don't know and it's probably cheaper than that pumpkin spice latte or whatever you like uh you know if you enter those you you know where at there's much that's much more expensive than a dollar 79 you know who we talking about <laughs> every plate cuts out trips to the grocery store and stressful meal planning so just sit back and enjoy cooking and get the dinner to the table in about 30 minutes every plate sent me some delicious meals that were wonderful i made them along with my wife you know my wife is pregnant right now so sometimes she doesn't feel like cooking i gotta do it on my own and normally that would scare the crap out of me but i got the every plate recipe cards i got everything going on that could help me and it was turned out just fine i'm sure it would have been better if my wife did it but <laughs> But it was fun and simple and enjoyable. And you can try every plate for just one dollar and seventy nine cents per meal by going to everyplate.com and enter that code Funches179. That's every plate for just one seventy nine per meal. Get started at everyplate.com and enter the code Funches179. That's up to a hundred and four dollar value. Every plate. <laughs>
It's like a lot like in stand up. That's what a lot of people would be refer as like finding your voice. Yes. Is that you can have the skill set of knowing how to put together a set, putting together a joke, and you can be technically sound, but people can look at you and go like, oh, like there's no voice there. You can you could be replaced by anybody. You know, at the end of the night, they don't go. Oh, I remember that person. They go like, oh, there was some joke. I don't know who said it. And what you're looking for at that point is that character, that thing that says like, oh, I know who that person is. I know who that motherfucker was. I remember them. And I think that's the difference, right? Between being, I guess that's the difference between drawing money. Well, you know, a classic uh, case would be Larry the Cable Guy when he was just working as Dan, or Whitting, whatever his last name is. But when he was just working with his regular accent, funny dude, te- you know, mechanically or technically funny, right? But when he put the character on, being the cable guy, that's when the gold hit. Hey, man, the dude was still the same. He just put on the accent, you know, started sawing off the sleeves of shirts. And then all of a sudden, he was funnier than shit. Mm-hmm. Okay, then, then all of a sudden, you know, I, I, things happen to me. I come up with this thing. I get dropped on my head. I got to change my style. I got to turn into a brawler. I turned into Stone Cold. And then I learned how to find myself from you know, like going back to being really me, talking shit, playing, you know, playing hard nosed football. You know, that's who I am on the football field or the baseball field or throwing the discus. So I just applied that into the work aspect of being a pro wrestler. And once I put, put those ingredients together, I found my voice and I found, you know, the, the body of work that would deliver me to, you know, where I went, but it was all about the gimmick, man. Mm-hmm. I want to talk a bit about, um, what that feels like to go from you put in like over a decade of work and you're one of the best wrestlers in the world for sure and you you're like you said the me- mechanic is you're looked upon as a guy who can deliver a solid match with anybody but they don't have any real plans for you and then you are the hottest thing in the business and it's it's only like you spend 10 years or more getting there and and we were running the top is what about three years four years well no it took me uh about seven and a half years before i got uh into wwf and then you know my, my total career was about 13 years because i broke in and back end of 89 i was a 1990 rookie of the year i retired in 03 uh technically from the ring after 19 wrestlemania 19 with the rock i stayed on a, a year or two or a year and a half later doing a general manager thing but then you've got to put in there uh you know the time when i got dropped on my after i decided i need to get my neck fused up three and four i was out for a damn near a year doing that mm-hmm. and then when they wanted me to, to job to brock and i said hey fuck you i'm out of here i was gone for six months there so you know it, it the, the whole ride wasn't that long but it was the hottest ride in the damn world when it was going yeah that's that's my question when you when you look back now I'm assuming you're fond of both sides, but do you find yourself looking more back of the days when you were struggling coming up or do you look back on the days when you were on top? I like both of them because, man, I love the feeling of uh, paying my dues. And I was living on raw potatoes, and I've told the story many times, but, I mean, I literally had no money. Where I was staying uh, on at the Congress Inn on Dickerson Pike in Nashville, Tennessee, it's still there. Uh, it was a real shithole back in the day. I don't know what it's like these days. And uh, it wasn't the greatest side of town to live in. And the people let me pay my rent whenever I had the money to pay the rent. And they knew I was cool. I wasn't going to skip out on them. Um, my brother co-signed on that Hyundai, $154 a month. I, you know, hell, I hid that son bitch a few times so I wouldn't get <laughs> repossessed. You know, so uh, those times, man, I was hanging around with the veterans and we're driving to and from the towns. And every town's over 150, 200 miles away. So the whole, you got to talk about something. So the only thing you're talking about is the business. Then you're picking their brain. They're telling you stories. You're talking psychology. You're absorbing it. You're like a sponge and they're pouring water and it's information into you. And you, you absorb all of that. Okay. And then you're at the mid range point. You're frustrated because your mechanic, you, you want more, but they ain't giving you more. And then all of a sudden you come up with a hot gimmick and then you're the number one thing in the world. And then that's when all the crazy money starts happening. So it's like shit. they each phase is 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 what it is, and it, 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 it's uh, I loved all of it. I loved I loved the great money, but I love paying my dues and starving and shit riding down the road. You know, after 
you know, cutting your head with the forehead, just try to entertain 66 people, <laughs> you know, at the uh, National Guard Armory in, in uh, Jacksonville or wherever it was right outside of Fort Worth. They were all good times. That's beautiful to hear. That's a mindset that um, I had to learn because I think for the longest time I was always like, Oh, I want to make it. I'm going to grind and I need to dig it. And I, I had my son already. And so I was struggling for two. And so I was just like, we need to fucking make it. We need to get there. And then, I mean, the first time I got on Conan O'Brien was that time when I was like, oh, okay, we did something. We're on TV. We made, we made our, one of our heroes laugh. Gen like, and you, you know, you know the difference. You can hear it. I'm like, I'm making him genuinely laugh. And so I'm like, oh, this is it. Things are great. And then the next day I had to fly my ass back to Portland and go do an open mic in front of six people, none of which who had seen that Conan, none of which gave a shit. And then it, it really, um, that was the moment it hit me where I had to go like, there's always going to be another day. There's always going to be another challenge. And so if I'm not happy with the struggle, I'm not going to be happy when I get something because I'm just going to be mad that it didn't come before, that it's not enough. You know, it's like, the the whole journey the whole goddamn job is a blessing and it took me a while to realize that and i um i think that's the difference though between like having real happiness and being content with yourself and so i just really like hearing that in you that that, that reaffirms it in me so i appreciate that yeah there's some good times and there's some bad times but it's it's, it's the ride that, that that's fun and you know shit if you get if you can travel up down the road with a bunch of idiots some of the best people in the world and some of the craziest most eccentric people in the world and it's kind of like an inner circle travel around the world telling stories in the ring having matches i mean shit and sometimes you know i remember when i first started out in dallas you know getting suplex in, on, in a parking lot of a chevrolet dealership you know <laughs> over in the used car section you know that shit sucked ass <laughs> <laughs> and then ringing up madison square garden with eighteen thousand plus in there to sell out or you know, 90,000 in Ford Field or setting a new indoor tennis record with The Rock and uh, 17 at the Astrodome. Uh, it, it's all good times, man. I, I just, I love the ride. But, but, you know, there's good and there's bad. And, you know, there's times, you know, like when you get strung out on the road when, you know, personal problems and all that other mm -hmm. stuff happens and you got to deal with that stuff on the road. Uh, through, through it all, I, I'm happy to have found what I found. And, and I enjoyed the whole fucking process. Nice. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Um, a couple more wrestling related questions, and I want to do some non wrestling things. Um, I want to know if how aware you are of, uh, similar to Ric Flair, uh, of your reach and the love that you have with young black people. Are you familiar with that? Do you know that? It seems like yeah. I'm I'm pretty aware of that. That's, okay good i want to make sure you're aware of that and um it's one of the things i love about you and it's one of the things i think that is kind of not necessarily confusing or people think that will have a misconception about you but one of the things i love when i see you on twitter is that you are an unabashed you know you're from texas you're a guy who who hunts and and, and you love your, your off-road vehicles and things of that nature but it's, anytime i've seen someone come at you with anything like racial or like um are, are sexist and they think that they're you're going to be on their side and you shut them down so quickly and i think it's got to be so goddamn confusing for them but i think that i guess it's not really a question but i think one of the reasons why you are a legend that you are and the star that you are is that you are such an individual and that you are hard to peg that you seem like you would be this one thing that is um very relatable but you're a very like complex person you are what um i think you you're what i would just call a man you're like you lead by you do what you want to do you might fuck you know apologize if you have to but you're not like you don't just do something because other people are doing it and i think that's one of the coolest things in in the fucking world and so i just wanted to tell you that no question just tell you that really yeah I, I just, uh, man, I, I am who I am. I don't, I don't pretend to be any different. And, and pretty much I asked you when we were texting about the show, I said, Hey man, I said, you know, I didn't know if we were just going to do a podcast audio was going to be for the, for your video show for YouTube. And, and you said, I said, cause normally, man, I, I normally just kind of roll around LA like a slob. 
<laughs> so I, I put on my jeans instead of wearing my camouflage shorts to dress up for you. But man, I, I, uh, I'm me and my mom always told me, you know, that that's all you can be. And, and don't get me wrong. You can be successful or, or piss poor or whatever, but you can always be you. And so I'm always me. And, and, uh, all my hunting and all the stuff that I believe in and those things I like to do. And it, I, with the hunting stuff, now I don't put a bunch of dang, you know, things on Instagram or whatever, because it'd be shocking for some people. They're not in for that. And I understand that. So I, there's a lot of parts, a lot of pieces of my life that I just kind of keep to myself because for a social media type thing, a lot of people don't consider it appropriate. So, but I do my thing and I mind my own business. And if somebody else likes something else, you know, more power to you. I, I'm going to do my thing. I fucking love it. I think that that's the absolute best and that's the best way to live. And I don't, fortunately, I don't think as many people do that as they should. Everybody's looking over their shoulder, looking for approval, uh, whether it's at work or social media or whatever, which I, I always felt like that's, that's not being a man. Um, and I'm glad you brought it up that it came from your mom because that was my guess. That was my guess because anyone who have met like that. It's always been kind of like instilled that that's where I got it from my mom. Um, she said something very similar to me the first day of school. She was just like, hey, the people who there's gonna be people who like you for who you are, there's gonna be people who never like you no matter what you do. So the people who you like you for who you are, go with them. The rest, fuck them. Just live your life. And when mom tells you that, like my mom told me that, I mean, when, when she said something, I mean, that's how it was because she wasn't wavering. She she had her stance and that was it. And, and that's where I got that from. Nice. I like hearing that. Okay. So then um, a little bit out, outside of the ring that I want to talk about is just the fact that um, you, you're a rare case in the fact that you made it to the very top of your industry. Like there was no higher place for you to go. No, Not many people ever get to achieve that in their industry. And But then you, it, it's fleeting. You have to, at some point, your body says you had enough and you got to move on and you got to start coming up with other challenges. I, just, I mean, I would think it would be, I wouldn't be dumb to not assume that that can be a sad progress process, a, a process of loss. Um, but what is it like to, to try to find new challenges to come through, to find new things that you want to do to get you up in the morning? What's that like? Well, I mean, the, the big, the biggest challenge for me was, you know, when I finally realized, you know, after WrestleMania 19 or leading into WrestleMania 19 with the rock, that was going to be my last match. Uh, neurological issues were really bothering me from when I'd got dropped on my head many years earlier and the C3-4 fusion was successful and I'm not in any pain, but I had some neuro neurological issues that, Hey man, I would be better walking away from the business of pro wrestling than staying in it and causing more harm to my body. So that was a hard pill to swallow, and it took me a long time to come to grips with that. And so now, you know, I look back at, you know, when you retire at 38, you know, and probably, you know, shit, man, I would imagine as a comedian, you know, you hit your prime at a later year just because you get you get the miles in, you get the reps in, mm -hmm. you get the learnings in, you get the read, you know, the, the, the crowd psychology. You can just you go into a room and read it. Same thing with the business, man. You learn more tricks. You learn how to apply them. And you know how to work, so man, to, to go out on your prime that, that hurt. And so, it took a long time. It took took me years to get over that. And then once I did, to answer your question, man, I I don't I I love to stay busy, but I also want to spend time with with my wife, my dogs, and have time for me, and to ride my buggies, my, you know, my, my four wheel drive stuff. I love to do my hunting, and there, there's got to be a balance because, you know, uh, I I just believe the way my parents brought me up. You're supposed to work because nobody's going to give you shit. Every now and then someone might, might just toss you a bone or whatever. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Take the bone. But no one, if, for, if you, if you, we were, we were taught in my family to, to work your ass off. And so mm -hmm. I just, I still believe in that. So I do my podcast and we've been lucky with the show with the USA network. I just uh, started doing a thing with WWE network where I'm talking to some of their top superstars uh, you know, I, I'm a brand ambassador for Kawasaki Motorsports, you know, in the beer business, pocket knives, and little projects, you know, Ronnie, but I, they keep me busy enough 
that uh, I still don't have a regular job, <laughs> you know? Because mm -hmm. if you film something like straight up, if you do 10 episodes, you film them, then you're done for a little bit. But then they air, okay, then you're ready to get back to work because you got your chops going. Mm -hmm. So, but then the other things kick in. So, you know, it's, it's, I get up every day looking forward to being productive and trying to, you know, you always, our word, like I said, I had to retire at 38. Shit, man, all of a sudden, you got a lot of money rolling in or money is rolling in and you, all of a sudden you start spending your money. Mm -hmm. You know, you want the money coming in to pay for that nut, that monthly nut. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want to be coming out of your damn bank account for that. But when you retire, effectively, that's what happens. Yeah. I always want to generate income because, like I said, coming from that middle class or lower middle class, we was never, ever rich. Mm -hmm. But knowing the value of a dollar, I, I, getting up to pay the bills still uh, motivates me. Mm -hmm. And and to to push myself but I'm not trying to to take over the world, so to speak. I'm just trying to take care of me and mine. Hell yeah. Fuck yeah. Um, man, there's one thing that you said in there that, that struck me uh, just about having more time to be at home with your family and having time with, with your wife and your dogs and stuff. Um, and so in, in a lot of ways, though, I mean, obviously it sucks to have to retire at your prime and, and you, and you would like to go out on your own terms, even though not, no, not many people get to do that. That's very, very rare. Um, but it's gotta be somewhat of a hidden blessing in there that you can relax more that uh, as a guy who is not built in you to do that. And you're not raised to do that in certain ways that you've been forced to do that it's got to be better for your relationship with your wife it's got to be i assume unless it's somewhat like me where it's like you can be home too much you can be you can be home too much but man i've been gone or i was gone i've been home for a long time now but you, you know when i used to film a couple of shows in, in, in mexico or out there even broken skull i'd live on set for five days and come home um so i could be gone a little bit but i was gone for so long and then you know, I had two daughters, I still have two daughters, but hell, I wasn't near as close as, you know, I should have been with them. And I missed out on a lot of things because I put myself first. I put the work first. I put my career first. I put my goals first. And, you know, that's what I was doing to pay the bills. But I, I, just, it's, I think you have to be selfish sometimes. I was. Yes. But, and I, and I admit that mm -hmm. because I could have, I could have picked another job to stay home and say, hey, I'm going to raise my family. I want to be home every single night. I didn't do that. I did what I did and I still, I ain't got no regrets, but now that, that I can do things and, and not be gone all along and, you know, traveling used to be fun back in the day when you're always on the road, because that's what you do, mm -hmm. you know, you, you know, but then when you stop and you turn back into a civilian, it's like, God dang, it's traveling. It's kind of sucks a little bit, but I, I, I've been gone so long. I just, I just like to, uh, I like to spend time now with, with, with my family or with my wife and, and my dogs. And I still like to man, get, get in our camper and drive and, and go do shit. Yeah. Um, I know exactly what you feel about. I just had, I, cause normally I'm usually on the road two to three weekends a month, three usually. And I had this time period where I had three weeks off in a row and it was only the first time where I was like, I am dreading this, this flight. Like, I don't want to do it. Uh, even though before I was just like, Oh, where are we going? Where are we going? Like, I forget. Like, that's the thing with my girlfriend. She's like, I don't even like, sometimes I'll just call you and I don't even know what city you're in. And I'm just like, this is, well, this is my job. This is what I sign up for. And I had, had the same realization with myself because a lot of my motivation especially when i was starting when i was young was about my son and about feeding him and getting a house for him and uh, and so i'd always put like i'm doing it for him i'm doing it for him but it, um you know a few years into it went by where i had to really just look at myself and go like no you you like this you're being selfish if you have the house you don't have to work three weekends out of the month you could slow down if you want to you don't want to you want to be great at this you you want to do this and i had to make that realization with myself and and it's helped just in my relationship as well as i've been honest with with, with, with my girlfriend who's now my fiance. um I'm just being like, yeah, this is what I, you, this is what you're signing up for. And she, luckily, you know, when I was married before and it didn't work out, is that she didn't know what she was signing up for. You know, now now that she does, and so things are, are a lot better. But it's it's kind of hard to look in your mirror sometimes and go and just go like, I'm being selfish. I'm being fucking selfish. Well, and and, and I didn't I didn't mean mean to make it all about being selfish, but yes, 
but on on, on the parallel with that or coinciding with that is, hey man, when you start getting hot, yeah, you, you're selfish enough to yeah, let's do this. There, here's the commitment for it, and this ain't no normal ride, but here we go. And you get hot, you got to make hay while the sun's shining. Absolutely, because you never know when the temperature temperature's going to change, or all of a sudden someone else is going to come along, and you're going to be you know fall off, or it's like. You know, when, when uh, all the hair bands and the rock and roll scene, and then all of a sudden here comes the grunge mm-hmm. scene. It's like, man, those guys kind of fell off. And then the grunge scene hit and the music business changed. It's like, shit, but the, all those guys was on the road like a motherfucker. So, you know, they, they were hitting it, but things change. So if you get an opportunity, you strike while it's hot. Because once it cools off, it's hard to get it hot again. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's the one thing I, I always... um. There's people who kind of take breaks from stand up or do take a, you know, especially in the winter. That's a known thing where people take breaks. Like I've, ne- like, I've never taken a break. I will slow down, but I always like, I never want to get off the road. I never want a thing to be, because I know there's some 20 year old, 25 year old stand up who's ready to take my spot. And as soon as I give it up, there, that's it. And so I, it motivates me not only to get better stand up, but also to start looking at my other options as far as like, okay, let me get out of the way for some of these young guys. So let me go look at some acting. Let me go do yeah. some things that I can do because they are fucking coming and they, um, you know, where I used to be able to just be fully focused on stand up, now I'm stand up acting podcast, trying to be a nice boyfriend, be a better father, and so th- it's split in my time, and I much rather split my time. And if I admit that to myself, I'm like, hey, fucking, you guys can have it. You know, there's always people behind you, so I think you're absolutely right. You have to always strike when you're hot because you just never know. But it was, but it was all those days on the road that gave you the opportunities for the acting and all the other stuff that, that would come that you're able to pursue now and then to stay true to the, to being a stand up. But Hey, I had other guys coming up, but Hey, they're going to put in a lot more time to be able to get the opportunities that you've got because you put in the time. Yeah. Yeah. True. Yeah. I mean, I just, I love the whole community about it. Um, I, I guess I do want to ask you a couple more wrestling things. It's just, is there anybody that you watch a fair amount now? I know I've seen you at a couple of, uh, a tweet about a couple of things. Is there anybody that gets you excited now that you're like, man, this is somebody to look out for? I'm trying to think, um, uh, cause I DVR every wrestling show that's out there but I don't get a chance to watch them all unless someone says, Hey man, you got to watch this. So then I, then I'll turn it on as far as someone new to the scene. I haven't seen anybody new to the scene, but you know, you know, Brock still Brock Cena faded off. He's done more acting stuff, you know, because of all the years on the road and mm-hmm. he need, you know, the road was beating him up and now it's opened other doors for him. So, uh, it, it's kind of been the same guys. I hadn't seen anybody new come out and, yeah, I, I I don't I don't want to sit here and beat a dead horse. I'm, yeah. I'm I'm still waiting for someone to, you know, Becky's still kicking ass. Uh, Charlotte's still kicking ass. I mean, the women are doing a lot of great things, but no one has just said, "Hey, man, this is the new guy." And I don't want to ever say this is the new Stone Cold, this is the new Hulk, this is the new Flair, this is the new Undertaker. You know, yeah, of course, ain't no, ain't no, you know, yeah. next, it's the, the next whoever it was. Yeah, no, yeah, no, Chappelle's not the new prior. Yeah, yeah, Chappelle, Chappelle. Yeah. <laughs> well said. Yeah, yeah, funny as fuck. But Richard Pryor, Richard Pryor, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> oh, on the other end of that, who's does it, who makes you laugh? I know you you watch a lot of comedy. Is there anybody that you've been? You make me laugh. I love it. That's all we needed. <laughs> <laughs> you can stop there. <laughs> you know, I, I I still enjoy Fluffy. I was watching the uh, the WWE backstage thing last uh, last night, and uh, we was flipping channels and caught it. I DVR it, and Fluffy was on, so I watched him do a segment, and he was on my show, and he's been over my house a couple times doing podcasts. He still makes me laugh. Uh, you know. Chris Rock still makes me laugh, but he kind of slowed down a little bit, hadn't he? Yeah. Uh, but you know, I cut my teeth on my go tos or my or my my like OG guys are like Richard Pryor and George Carlin. Those are kind of my steadfast guys that were just rock solid. And you know, thinking about Richard Pryor, you know, he he was he could cuss a blue streak, and he did. But he his style was such that as much as he cussed, it didn't offend you in my opinion, whereas some people, when they cuss, it just grates on you. Mm-hmm. It sticks out. 
with him, it doesn't. It just as part of him telling a, a, an amazing story that you can laugh your ass off at. Uh, you know, uh, Mitch Hedberg is no longer with us, but he was a guy that still I'll get on YouTube and watch him. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people don't get him. And, and I'll put him on. I'll say, dude, you, you just, just, just watch this guy. And they're like looking at the YouTube screen like, Man, fuck, I don't get it. All right. Fuck, I guess you just don't get it. Hey, that's the one thing we first bonded over is when I texted you about being on your podcast. And uh, I, we just talked. I think, yeah, we just had a little conversation over the phone. And then one of the last things you said to me was like, hey, you influenced by Mitch Hedberg? And I was like, this motherfucker <laughs> here, he, know, he knows stuff. He, you, you in it. <laughs> but there's a lot of people, yeah. You 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 either with Mitch, you either know or you don't, you know. But the people who do know know he's he's brilliant. He's an amazing dude, and it's a shame that we lost him so early. I wish I could have. I never got to meet him. I always wanted to. I know his uh, ex wife and or his widow. Uh, but man, yeah, one of my favorites, one of the best of all time. Um, now you talked about you to have your show and your multiple shows, your show on the WWE network, show on the, on the USA network. You got your beer, you got your pocket knives. Um, are there any other goals that you have now? Anything that, that you're working on, whether it's like for your career or just for, for personal life, is there any, th- any goals that you've set reason or physically? I know you've been getting back in shape more and more, man, you know, we started uh, my beer with the El Segundo Brewing Company. It's uh, Steve Austin's Broken Skull IPA. And myself and the owner sat over a table with about 10 or 12 beers on there. And we went through them and we were tasting them. And we come up with the formula, long story short. And so we released that beer almost four years ago. And I always talk about it on a podcast. But it's only available in SoCal. You know, it's a small brewery. You know, and they make awesome IPAs, some of the best that you'll find. And so it's, it's, it's in SoCal and we got a chance to ship some to the East coast. So now it's available in New York, New Jersey, and Massachusetts, and then a little bit in Portland now too. So I think in 2020, you know, we'd like to go to six or eight other States. I would like on a personal level, just because that is my beer that we created that has my DNA and my taste buds all over it because it was, it was created how I described it to Rob Croxall, the owner and so I'm very proud of that beer. And if we could get that thing nationwide, that would be a goal. Or, you know, uh, I'm with Kawasaki to keep spreading the word uh, about the, the new Kawasaki side-by-sides because that's the division where I, I, I uh, represent to keep spreading the word and, and growing that because I've been riding that brand forever. And just uh, for, for my show, for Straight Up, I, I hope we got, you know, get green lit for season two. And I wanted, I'd love to do that for hell. I mean, I, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good. I could probably do it for shit a pretty good while longer. So the the show with WWE Network is going to debut on November 24th, right? Our Survivor Series. So I'd love for that first one to hit so people are hungry. Uh, for the next ones, they're going to hit once a month where I'm talking to some of the top WWE superstars. I enjoy being back in business with the WWE. You know, I've always been tied to them because of my career. I'm still a part of the company, but, but just to be associated with it. Uh, so I, I want to be able to keep entertaining uh, my original OG fan base. that comes from the wrestling world. A lot, of, a lot of people are straight up. They don't even know that I wrestled. Mm. Obviously a lot of people do. So I've been able to kind of, you know, transcend the business a little bit that way and have success from something where I didn't, you know, I'm out there flipping around a ring, getting hit in the head with steel chairs. You know, it's just my interactions with my guest. So that's cool. I want to grow that as well. But I, I, I always stay true to my wrestling roots. That's what got me to the, that's the dance that got me here. And I want to keep paying respects to that because they're, they're my original fan base. And I want to, I, I want them to keep appreciating me, and I want them to know that I appreciate them for sticking with me for all these years for all the stupid shit that I did. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, well, I think they definitely stick with you. I think if, uh, the last time you were on, like you know, the just the pop that you got, just the love that you get, that's on a whole, sometimes a whole nother level, and you know, and I'm sure the absence makes the heart grow fonder, but. My, is you just kind of see like the the level of connection that you got with people um and again of all races all colors all creeds of people who just identify with you not just because the character was great and it's easy to get behind of someone who um 
hates their boss and is getting shit on by their boss and has to and is the only person that gets to actually say fuck you and kick their boss's ass that's so easy to get behind but i think it's also was just because i don't think it would have been something that people people knew it wasn't fake you know people knew that you had lived that life that you had been frustrated that you had gone through all these things and if, if it was just some character with, that came together on someone else it wouldn't have worked it worked because it was true I think the character was true to life, and I think the intensity was, was at a exponential level that some people didn't possess or ascend to. And you know, talking about that pop man, you you know how it is, dude. When you when you either get announced or when people are responding to your jokes, I mean, dude, that's response. That that's that's you know how how they taking you. Yeah. And so man, you 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 live and die by that. It's a drug. You know. Yeah. It is. And that that's like okay, how am I doing? They'll let you know how you're doing. So it's always cool. It's always cool to get that. But I don't know because it's, it's just me sitting here, and I can't really. I'll never forget when I was getting inducted into the Hall of Fame in WWE. They had a five minute video package that they played, and I was sitting up there. The first time I'd seen it, <laughs> and I'm, I'm I'm sitting there watching that video package, and I'm like. Shit, it dawned on me right there. I had a whole speech in my in my in my jacket. I think I might have had it in my hands, but I didn't even open it up because when I saw that package, it was like shit. I, I've been doing this for thirteen years. I, I'm, I'm retired, and now I'm going to Hall of Fame. And right now, I'm finally understand how I resonated with people or how people how people enjoyed me. I was so far in the forest, I couldn't see the trees. Mm. You know, I didn't really know the contributions that I had made to the business. I knew that I was on fire. I knew I sold a lot of tickets and merch, but I didn't get it. And so the, 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 when I when I saw that, it's like, hey, this is pretty damn cool, man. So it, it, it was a, it was kind of a it was a real come to Jesus meeting with myself. And it turned out pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, a lot of people it goes the other way. So. And I, like, cause I, I, I don't, I, I don't know how to explain my success. I, I'm, I was a good worker, good trash talker, but intensity and true to life. And so the, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, a lot of people like you, like Cena and, and Rock and stuff. They do a lot more acting. You've done a, some acting, but you tend to stay true to like you like to do more talking head interview series things of that nature. Do you see yourself ever dipping back? Because I've heard you talk before. You don't really like dealing with scripts or things of that nature. Nah, man, I don't. And when I first came to L.A., you know, after being retired for I think I think it was about a year and a half. I think I think I always say three years. I think it was a year and a half before I woke up one morning and I said, Hey man, you've been doing this a long time. I was doing stuff that, you know, a lot, a lot of drinking and shit, trying to deal with the fact that you had to walk away from the business when you're white hot. And it, I didn't handle it that great. And so I finally said, dude, you know, you did some Nash bridges back in the day and th those were high rated, uh, episodes. So you need to take your forklift driving ass, retire from the business of pro wrestling out to LA and see if you can make an, somewhat of a name for yourself based off the name you created in wrestling. So I came out here, moved in with Diamond Dallas Page and Playa Vista there in his condo and just kept fiddle fucking around. And finally we found some people up in Vancouver and started making low budget movies. And I could sit here three feet from you and say, these was independent movies. No, they're fucking low budget movies. <laughs> <laughs> because there is a difference and there ain't a difference. All depends on how you want to spin it. They were low budget movies and it was cool, you know, because it was a means to an end. Mm -hmm. So I figured, okay, this acting, I'll do some of these movies and I'll go to the, the bigger type stuff. But then Tough Enough came calling when, when WWE and USA Network rebooted that. And I got a taste of reality television. Not, uh, you know, kind where you don't want to be reality television. Yeah. Good shit. <laughs> Not reality the television. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So I said, oh, this, this is what I like. And then I got pitched a show from CMT called Redneck Island. We did five of that. But on top of that, I said, okay, well, I'll do that. But let me pitch you this Broken Skull Challenge, the challenge show that your trainer yeah. was talking to me about. And they cancel that. And then here comes USA Network with this one. So, yeah, I like to live in, in the, hey, let's, let's trade back and forth and go, you know, like you and me are and uh, have a conversation i don't like to member memorize anything because it's I, like i told you on the phone it's, it's like scraping my face on barbed wire i'd rather do that than try to memorize anything so i'm not against acting i just i i find that 
and I, I could make some pretty good money acting. I'm mm -hmm. not going to say I'd be the, uh, you know, the, the greatest actor in the world, but I'm doing, I'm successful enough doing what I'm doing that I like what I'm doing. And if I, if I ain't got to do something that I don't want to do, fuck why I do it. Yeah. I ain't going to live forever. So why should I torture myself to try to make a couple more dollars that I ain't going to spend anyway? Cause I'm so fucking cheap. <laughs> 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 Why well, I want to be goddamn just a, a, a loaded ass millionaire, miserable because I'm working. Now nah, I'd be, I'd rather be okay and be happy as a motherfucker. Hell yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of damn sense to me. People, we... But people always tell me, they say, "God damn, man, you ought to do more acting." Which shit? Because you think I ought to? Because I want to? Because yeah. I don't really give a fuck about it. No, that's yeah, that's it yeah. exactly. That's um, I, I've never been. But that goes with every type of business, whether it's wrestling or everything. One thing that bothers me is like when you see someone, another athlete who doesn't like wrestling and they just come. If you love it, that's another thing. But yeah. if you come into it and you don't love it, that's that's horrible as a fan. It's horrible to me as a comedian when I see people who don't in the comedy and they just come in and get over because someone thought they should or someone thought they could get a quick check from it. Because overall, to me, it, it it hurts the business. It hurts the very craft and the things that I spend so much time putting effort into. And same thing with acting. I love acting. I go to class. I do everything I can do it. So if you don't want to do it, don't fucking muck up the works just because you can make a check because somebody else wants you to do it. It's a waste of time. Man, it's funny talking about acting. I did an episode of Chuck a while back and uh there was a girl out there a young lady she was 33 and she'd been acting since she was three and she's already in like several of the upper echelon acting type things that you can get on get in like a, a hall of fame if you will i don't know what to call it anyway she was uh an extraordinary actor very beautiful she was only 33 and i know uh, she was talking to me we were talking between scenes and she goes well uh, who do you study with because at the time i was kind of pursuing acting and I said, well, nobody. Boy, she looked at me like I was a pile of shit. <laughs> <laughs> and she, and she, she goes, you ain't studying with nobody? Why not? I, I said, I said, do you? She goes, well, of course I do. Like three or four days a week, along with being a working actress and a really good one. And I, I, and I, and I was like, hey, boy, kind of made me take my head back. I, and I, then I got her. I understood what she was saying is be like, we was talking about lifting weights earlier before we started rolling the microphones. And I said, yeah, I'm still, you know, I'm going to the gym, you know, I'm in the gym five days a week. Well, same thing for this chick, this young lady who her, this was what she wanted to do. She kept her chops up. She studied because it was her passion. She loved it and all the different, you know, whatever artistic ways to express yourself. That that was her. That was what she did to stay on top and be as badass and fulfill her life with the way the way she wanted to fulfill it. Mm -hmm. wasn't wasn't really something I was that interested in. And I wasn't putting any extra work to be at her level, and I probably never would be at a level. But you know, to to make a you know not to beat a dead horse, I, I go to the gym every damn day and do some type of phys physical activity because I like to do it, and it's me. That wasn't for me, mm -hmm. but I get it now. Yeah. Same thing with going to wrestling school for me. I was like, I want to try it. I like watching it. And I went in there and, I, and they were talking about all the sacrifice. They were like, we need people to help set up the ring. And we need, if you if you work in a regular, like if you work in a full-time job, consider cutting your hours. And I was like, I already did this for stand-up. I, I went through this whole sacrifice thing for that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to be a 36-year-old PWI rookie of the year. It's not going to happen. So I probably should just say goodbye and let the people who really want to do this fucking do it. So I guess I'm letting people do it. Really want to do it? Do it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, but don't get me wrong. If you're watching this, don't think just because I done told Ron that I don't really give a shit about acting <laughs> that I don't want a sweet ass cameo. <laughs> <laughs> See, because like you know, Ron, all I need is a sweet ass camo. Ca uh, camo. I'm not the camouflage. <laughs> Fuck. Don't even worry about that, that out. Cameo. <laughs> Shit. I ain't even started drinking yet. Cameo to keep that sag insurance. Hell yeah. No, but a cameo's cool. Day two work. Get your shit in. Stand in the corner. Look menacing or have a funny line. You know, like with Adam Sandler. He's always give me a funny line or something like that. You know, uh, yeah, that's all I need. 
Yeah. Oh, no. I mean, I could see you in, in many type of co comedic situations just being yourself. And that's just funny. It's just hilarious. There's many things that I think you could do and not necessarily have to um, play a character or be scripted. Dude, I, I, I'm, I'm here in town. I, I live in L.A. I've been here 15 years. Come and go uh, from Nevada now that we sold that place in Texas. So, you know, doing something like that would be cool because, you know, hey, man got a sweet gig for you man they're gonna give you this you do this and get your lines it's like Shh, already got it memorized mm -hmm. or uh, scsa in the corner looks up and looks down love it <laughs> <laughs> you got it put us in a comedy together it's gonna be great put me make me go hunting make him go do other things <laughs> I'm just gonna. Hey, you remember all the lines? I'll spin off of you. Perfect. I got it. I'll do that. I, I'll go to class. <laughs> Where are we at, time wise, Halston? Hmm. Perfect. Time to land this plane. Um. How we usually we end this podcast by the same thing. We, we we're just gonna ask you for a piece of advice for maybe just something you've been thinking on, something that you've realized recently that could. Our podcast is just about self improvement, self help, getting better. Um. So if there's something that you just been thinking about recently that's helping you get better that you could share with us. You know, it's very vague. You know, it's very vague. You'll nail it. Everyone does. No, it ain't vague because I was just talking to a buddy of mine from Texas who kind of had a little bit of uh, trouble and it kind of related to me in a way. And I was like giving, giving him some advice that, that I've taken many times in my life. You know, like there's some times where shit's going to be great. And then all of a sudden someone's going to yank the rug out from under you and things are going to go, go to, to be in the shits and if you try you know when you hit hard times or if you get knocked down or if someone tells you no you get rejected or you find failure man don't don't give up my advice is get back on your horse and keep fucking riding don't quit or stand up and start marching if you don't like riding a horse <laughs> but just get back on your horse get back on your horse and keep going forward Ain't no, ain't no use looking back. Whatever you did back in the old days ain't helping you now. If it gave, gave you a little bit of a opportunity, if you give up, that's on you. So just don't ever give up. Get on your fucking horse and keep going. Beautiful advice. I think and Ron, and that's the fucking bottom line because I said so. <laughs> don't be afraid to get up on that motherfucker and keep riding. <laughs> oh it's perfect so many people i think there's so there's so many people who never start the people who never who never take that and leave you know if if they have that passion you know if they're just making their ends meet on that forklift but they love wrestling so many people never even try it no never went to that first class and that's a shame that's a tragedy man live life yes god dang try something Absolutely. Go, go out on a limb push the envelope if i would have never i know we're trying to go home here no you do but, it but if i if, if i if, when i got to wwf you know when they call me the ringmaster and i come up with a stone cold idea and i you know i start you know talking and get some commentary uh, opportunities. I start talking shit, then started editing my lines because back in the old days, you know, I was popping the guys in a truck and I said, Hey man, I said, I noticed because we would film a raw, then we'd film another one right after. And that one would go to post because we couldn't go live every single mm -hmm. week because it was too expensive. The, the business was down. And I said, Hey man, I know when we're going to post, you're editing some of the lines I'm saying. I said, I said, why is that? And he goes, well, quite frankly, Steve, and this is why we're walking to a TV in Lowell, Massachusetts, right across the parking lot. And I didn't even know Vince. I knew him. He's my boss, but we didn't know each other. And I said, well, why are you editing my lines? He goes, well, quite frankly, Steve, you're popping the guys in the truck, meaning you're getting a response like you're popping a crowd. Yeah. Hey, man, if you can pop those motherfuckers in the truck, those you can the pop hardest anywhere because they heard yeah. everything. Exactly. I told him, I said, listen, Vince, I said, you got guys here, 6'10", 7 feet, 300 pounds. I said, I'm 6'2", 250, a bald head, goatee, and black trunks and black boots. I said, if you take my personality from me, I said, I can't compete. If you give me my, my personality, I can compete with anybody you got. He goes, okay, Steve. And that's when he stopped editing my lines. And that's when I started talking all that shit. And I started cussing, not to the level that my man Richard Pryor was at, <laughs> but what I could get by on TV, right? So I wasn't afraid to push the envelope. I wasn't afraid to crawl out on that limb. And so I'm not blowing smoke up my ass. We're talking to the people out there that, hey, man, if you're going to do something, shit, don't sit back there and wonder about it. Do some research, smarten yourself up, take an educated and calculated leap and have some confidence, believe in yourself, because if you don't believe in yourself, ain't nobody going to believe in you, and fucking go for it. 
I can't say it better than myself. I think that's the best way to end the podcast, you know? Start, and once you start, don't give up, you know? Nothing worse than somebody who never was and someone who was halfway there and and, then gave up, packed it in, turned around, you know? You're already on that journey. Keep pushing forward. Steve, man, I knew it would be a pleasure talking with you. I had so much fun on your podcast. Appreciate you again making a trip, coming to see me. Um, just enjoy you. You're very cool dude. Thanks a lot for coming. Thank you guys for listening. Bye. If you enjoyed this episode, please check out our last episode right over here. Bam! Or perhaps a video picked by our overlords at YouTube. Boop. And don't forget to subscribe. Hit it up. Hit it up. Press the button. Press it!